to Salt Lake City. I'm Steve. I'm Jared. And I'm Derek. He's over there behind the camera today. We've got with us Jared Williams again, uh, part two of our video series with Jared. Last time Jared was here, we talked about what you need to do to get into blacksmithing, right? Yeah, kind of covering the basics. Covering uh, the basic, basic tools, tools, basic kind of mentality around some of it, mm -hmm. I think we touched on. Yep. Yeah, nothing too intimidating. Today, I think we're gonna cover some uh, steels, yeah. some basic techniques. Uh, talk a little bit about Damascus. Give us a little background. Who are you and what? You, how long have you been doing this? I've been doing this actually for 31 years this year. So I was 15. Um, I'd always been making stuff, as, even as a kid. I was that kid that always took the toys apart mm -hmm. and then put them back together. Um, I technically made my first knife when I was nine years old um, out of a piece of sheet metal and willow branch. You know, mm -hmm. a nine-year-old kid wouldn't even cut grass, piece of sheet metal, right. floppy, whatever. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I've still got drawings though of knives I wanted to make when I was that age. So 15 years though, 15 years old in high school, I'm taking machine shop. Um, so my machine top shop teacher says you can make a knife out of a file. He says, now I can't let you make the knife in class, but you can do it and he explained how. Well, luck would have it. I was walking home from school. I found a file laying on the sidewalk. I had a grinder that I had bought. And so I made my first knife off with a grinder out of a file. Okay. and then later made a knife with a file. So that, that was 31 years ago is when I made that first knife. And it's just snowballed. And that's become my obsession of tools and crafting things. So if you're gonna estimate, how many knives do you think you've made? I've probably a thousand or more. Jeez. I'm guessing. I've made half of one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those would be about a thousand where I did a hundred percent of the work. Mm -hmm. About a thousand, yeah. We didn't talk about one very important part of the knife making process. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk about the metal. Yeah. Uh, this is my first attempt. Yep. And we, as we spoke last time, it's a flat piece of rebar. Yes. So talk to me a little about rebar. This is a, a lot of people start here because walking home from school. You can find rebar anywhere. Right. Here's the beauty of rebar. It's plentiful, you find it everywhere. Mm -hmm. Can you harden it, make a knife out of it? You can't harden it per se. Is it completely worthless in knife making? No. Um, two aspects. One, maybe somebody has this emotional attachment to a piece of rebar they found as a kid and they want to make a knife out of it. You could technically integrate that rebar into Damascus. We'll touch on that later. Mm -hmm. Another aspect though that people don't seem to understand. Rebar's cheap and you find it everywhere as we all know. Right. I mean, you can buy it at Home Depot. It's so cheap. So it's a perfect platform for when you're learning how to move metal and you don't want to waste money on good steel. Mm -hmm. It's like you can pound on it all day long and you can learn how steel is moving. And people say, well, then you're losing time. No, you're not losing time because you've gained knowledge because you've been learning. It's just a question of expectation, though. Don't take yes. this and think you're going to make some amazing buoy. No, knife. you're not. Okay. No, what you're going to make is you're going to make practice. You're learning. This is a learning process. Mm -hmm. Nobody forges their first knife perfect. Well, maybe maybe somebody has. Right. I, I tell people all the time, I didn't get good the first time. I screwed up a whole lot of stuff to get good. Man, have I failed a lot. Just trying something, not accomplishing it. Was it a failure? No. I failed. Yes, by the term of failing, yes. But did I fail? No, because every single thing was a learning experience. So where do people go from rebar? So from rebar, you know, practicing, you hear a lot about the railroad spikes. Do I love railroad spikes? No. Do I hate railroad spikes? No. A railroad spike is a railroad spike. There's low carbon spikes, there's medium carbon spikes, and there's high carbon spikes. A high carbon spike, if it's actually high carbon, sometimes they're high carbon, sometimes they aren't. But that's another one. That's like, a, I would call that a step up from rebar. Okay. Meaning, you, if you get a, a H stamp railroad spike, you can forge into a new knife. It's probably gonna harden a little bit. And then you got a knife you can use. The beauty with a railroad spike though is you got the head on it, you can do a lot of artistic things with it. And you can actually finish the knife with it. And you got this cool thing you can use. I've seen some of the ram's head stuff people do that's just exactly. amazing. It's awesome. It's all steel. It's all usable. It's all good stuff. From here. So from there, and, and, and we're kind of working up the progression, right? right? From like no money, we're just like scavenging in the dumpster for steel. So the next step it would be leaf springs. Okay. You can go to a junkyard, you can get them dirt cheap. So a lot of times you can find them for free from a buddy or whatever. 
5160 or 8670, very similar steels, fully serviceable as knives, fully now, functional. I've heard you want to go for older leaf springs because newer ones, just they've changed the myth. Okay. Myth and legend. Honestly, I, I've, I've worked with really old leaf springs. I've worked with really new leaf springs. It's, it's what batch, what batch of steel was that in? Sure. A lot of that really deals with batch stuff. So the whole, the, the older steel is better steel mm -hmm. is a myth in, in my personal belief. You've got other kind of, we're kind of in the found steels category, yes, right? Yes, very much in the found steels. So I, I, I do enjoy found steels. This is, uh, this is an old 5.56 five, uh, MP5 barrel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could definitely work that down. I'm guessing this is probably 4140, so it is hardenable. Mm -hmm. um, not super hard. It won't be as hardenable as some of the other like 1095 steels, not by any means. Could you totally make this? Yes, you could. So with these found steels, you don't so, always know what you're getting. So how can you tell? What What are some things you can do to, to find out besides I know you, you can have, make a little... Yeah, man, you could go in and send it to a metal or just have them zap it. I've actually done that with some steel. With a railroad spike. Now, so you can spark test it. Essentially, you put it on a grinder yeah, and you, you put see it on a grinder what and happens. You check the sparks and they'll, and sometimes it'll just be a little simple orange line. That's typically low carbon. Uh -huh. But then it'll start fracturing. And based off that pattern of fracture is how you can tell if it's high carbon or medium carbon or low carbon. But even at that, there's still a little bit of, but it will definitely give you a better idea. Yes, it will. You know, yeah, but I've had stuff that I sparked that didn't look high carbon that ended up hardening just fine. That's why I ended up sh sh sending it off to a uh, metallurgist. And he was like, oh, well, it's this low carbon 1045, but they put vanadium in it. Vanadium. Yeah. <laughs> metallurgist voodoo Obvious. magic. Yeah. So is it good? <laughs> He's like, well, whatever you did with it, it's working. So yes, I'll call it good. I'm like, Great, I'll keep using it. <laughs> so then we can go into some of these other steels. So this yes, is some known, stuff known steels, known steels. steels. Yes, this yes, is yes. stuff you can buy it online. There's a couple, you know, there's usually a place in town you yeah, can go to. And, there's and, a lot of resources it. for good known steel. So yep. this is a piece of 1080, which is great. I love 1080. It's one of my favorite for the simple. That would be a simple carbon steel. This is you can still see it. There's still a little bit of remnants of that from 1095. 1095. Yep, which is great steel. The 10 means 10 is. Basically, it's a simple carbon steel. It's iron, carbon. Steel is an alloy. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not an element. To make steel is you add carbon, which mm -hmm. is in everything, to iron. That makes a simple steel. So the 1095, the 1080s, the 10 series steels are basically simple steels. It's carbon and iron. And then there's obviously some trace elements that you can never get away from. Now, yeah. then there, if you, if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of all the different steels, I've got an app on my phone. Yes, uh, I probably got the same app. Actually. Yeah, and yeah. it'll you you punch in. You're you're sitting there. You say, okay, I've got 15 N8. Yeah. What is this? And, and can I make a knife out of this? Break everything down for you. Yep, and yeah. it tells you exactly. So and there's a bunch. The same app even tells you like what they typically use it for as well in industry. Yep. Yeah, great apps. So let's talk about Damascus for a little bit. Technically, what it is is layer multi-layered welded steel or pattern welded steel meaning you take multiple layers of steel you forge weld them together at a specific temperature and then as you either as you grind through those layers you create the effect so typically what you would do is use two differing steels like 15 and 8 and 10 8 the two steels we have here mm -hmm. okay 15 and 8 has a lot of nickel in it so when you etch it in, in the acid the nickel acts as almost resist. It doesn't let this steel etch as mm -hmm. much as the 1080. So if you take these two dissimilar steels, you forge weld them together at a certain heat, and then you can stack up, say, 30 layers of, of alternating layers. Mm -hmm. Then when you grind through those layers, and then you etch it in acid, the 15N8 or 15N20 won't etch as much as the 1080, so you see the differing layers. Mm -hmm. And then you can treat it with coffee and different things to bring out colors. Which so is, that gives you your patterns. Like this was done on a twist. You can tell, I can just tell from having done it. Sure. This is a twist pattern. And these are two dissimilar steels, possibly three on this one. And that's what gives you that pattern. So what they've basically done is taken perfectly, acceptably good steels that are totally fine to make a knife on their own. Mm -hmm. They've put them together to create a pattern. So now they're going for aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Are they making a superior blade? No, not nowadays. Are okay. they making a superior aesthetic blade? Yes, if they did it well. 
And that's what this, I mean, this is, that's beautiful. It's definitely not my main focus, but there's some guys out there that are mind blowing with their abilities, with what they're able to pattern with it and work with it and do with it. And I got nothing but the utmost respect. So why did they in, in times past have to fold and- Fold the steel, right. which is what they were doing. Um, they had crap. They were making it from rocks. They had a charcoal pit and a couple helpers and rocks that they would make this bloom of sponge iron, this pocky, holy sponge looking thing. So they had to basically knead it like bread. And the more you knead it, the more impurities come off of it. So you'd start with, you know, a 50 or a 50 pound chunk of metal, pot iron from this mm -hmm. smelt you did. And if you're lucky, you'd get half of that, maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe a third of that would actually be usable steel. And so nowadays, nowadays we've got blast furnaces and all these amazing electric arc furnaces and everything and we heat it up and then we can test it and we can shoot it with a laser and say we've got this exact quantities of manganese and iron, copper, selenium, carbon, vanadium, chromium and oh, we don't want that much so let's throw some more carbon in here and some more iron in here to offset the ratios of this and this and boom we have 1080 steel and we can make them perfect. We've never made better steel than we have right now in the history of the planet. Basic parts of a knife. Obviously, you have the handle. The tang supports the handle. Mm -hmm. Point, your edge, your spine. Tip, the flats of the blade, or you know, it's basically the bevels that go mm -hmm. down to the edge. Your ricasso area, which is the area in between your edge and the top of your handle. Okay. You have your guard area. These are bolsters. So here's the beauty of where we're at. You could make this the spine or this the spine. So at this point in both of our knives, we're not really set on anything. We, we have the freedom because we're forging. Here's the beauty of forging, is you're not always set on something. When you, when you have just a bar of steel and you're doing a stock removal with no forging, you're pretty much set with the limitations of that rectangle. When you're mm -hmm. forging, you could say, actually, I want to turn the tip the other way. And you heat it up. Mm -hmm. And you lay it on your anvil, and instead of hitting the tip this way now, well, now I want to go the other way. Cool. Flip it over, mm -hmm. move it the other way. And then after forging, well, then we can dress it up on the belt grinder. Well, at this point, we've talked enough. Let's heat up the forge and let's get pounding some steel. I'm on it.
We don't have knives yet. Not yet. Almost. Close but on. what I have now is a knife-shaped object. This is correct. You a did. KSO. Yes. And quite a nice one, too. Well, I'm excited. This is uh, a big step. Is this step. your first official knife-shaped object? This is my first steel. official... Well, unless... Yeah, unless we want to count this. Is this a KSO? No, I don't that, think it that's is. That's a flat piece of rebar. Yeah. There was a moment when we were making these on both knives mm -hmm. where I was watching... And it's like, you know, when you're watching the artist that is doing the, the painting, and you're like, I can't see what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, he flips it upside down, and then there's the painting. Suddenly you see it. So there's the image. On both of these knives, there's a moment in yours, mm -hmm. where as you were forging, I'm like, oh, there's the knife. There it is. And then mine, I let it out an audible, like, Yes. <laughs> there's a little bit of excitement around that moment. Yeah. It was cool, though. It's way cool. Yeah. And then also, the phase shift. Yes. Talk a little bit about the phase shift. It's phase shift. So, so we talked a little bit about um, critical temperature, non-magnetic, all that stuff in the heat treating phase. So the phase shift, as, as you'll see in the video, is where the carbon turns to solution. It's basically a liquid form in the blade. Mm -hmm. That's when it's like orange hot. So as the blade cools, that carbon is going to go back to a salt. Mm -hmm. During that phase shift, the, the, the shadows that you see in the steel, like the steel heats back up. And it becomes bright orange again as this carbon transforms some liquid back into a salt. So, so that we're going to do a part three. In a part three, we're going to cover, we're going to grind. Yep, we'll grind finish. it. Finish. Anything else we need to well, cover? Well, we're going to grind it, heat treat it, mm -hmm. finish grinding. Perfect. That would be part three, and then we'll have a finished knife. So stick around for the next video. It's coming out. Uh, we'll finish these, and we'll actually have, take a KSO and turn it into a knife. A knife. Bye. Cool. Did we get audio on that? Yeah.